Lord be with you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? He sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the city, and a man will meet you carrying a jar of water. Follow him. Wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher said, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. The disciples then went off, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. While they were eating, he took bread and said the blessing, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them. And they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, for which many will be shed. And then I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine till the day when I drink of it in the new kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. The Gospel of the Lord. Uh, if at all possible in your life, if you can take a trip to the Holy Land, uh, it, it's worth every penny. Because you, you get you get a, a visceral, a, a bodily feel of what is a spiritual inheritance that we have, which is kept forward in tradition and in the Word of God. But, you know, like, it really makes a difference when you get out on the Sea of Galilee in, in some barge, right? And you pray. Especially it was true when I went there with 11 other priests, you know, and you're doing the, the prayers of the church. Uh, it's moving. Uh, we get up, you know, and uh, disembark to Capernaum. And, you know, I mean, the way I did it with the, you know, with the synagogue that was there, it's not very big. But I mean, in a matter of minutes, you can walk on every tile that's in there, and you know that you walk in the feast of, of the feet of Jesus. You know, is that, you know, Peter's mom's house? Well, that's what they describe it as. Um. Same thing is true when you when you go to Jerusalem and and uh, it's so commercialized, but still, you know you can walk the way of the cross and you can go into the upper room. Was that the, is that exactly the upper room? I don't know, but you might as treat it as so as a spiritual inheritance. And you know the, I mean you can let it move you as much as you want or as little as you want. And it's not just the, um, you know, the, the physical surrounds, but, you know, environment makes a difference. It does. And, you know, then you can have that personal experience, body, blood, soul, and divinity of following Jesus. Because it isn't always evil. I mean, it isn't always easy. And evil enters in trying to uh, break your concentration, tell you that it's not true. Uh, do, you know, like, what are you wasting your time doing this for? Like, I don't spend the rest of my day, you know, wasting it on stuff that doesn't matter, you know? I, so it becomes this exercise in faith. And that's absolutely true with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But as we, we heard, you know, they recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Because it, it's a continuance of Passover. You know, the, the, 
how Passover is laid out and how that that's celebrated and the exodus from Egypt and all of that. You know, coming across the desert, getting into a new land of you know, milk and honey and um, I believe this absolutely that Jerusalem will never be conquered. No way. Because then you got, you know, when you get done fighting the Israelis, we're dug in like, you know, I mean, uh, the one guy that was on my bus, and he was the driver, he just got a whole career of being in the, uh, the, uh, the army, and his daughter was was going to start her military career at 18 because they all got to go, and he had a son that couldn't even tell his mother where he was because... He was in some special forces someplace. He, and the bus driver said, like, it would be really foolish to attack Israel because we have no place else to go. And I really took that at heart. And that's kind of our faith, too, um, for those who profess Christ. You know, where are you going to run away to? Because the persecution is already here. It's going to continue to get worse. But it will never overcome us. Ever. We just need to stand our ground and give no ground. We don't have to, we don't have to be aggressive. But you just got to hold your ground. And, you know, I've been through some stuff where these college professors... Uh, who claim to be priests, but they, they don't practice it, and they don't believe in it. And then so they start taking an intellectual attack on me, I just sit there. You know, because when it's my turn, like my mother said, why do you use your fist? You can carve them up with your tongue, and I can't. You know, I mean, like, don't come at me like that. Because I believe, and you believe, I mean, how is it that God can become one of us? Huge mystery. Huge. But then, if he can become one of us, can't he choose to become a piece of bread and a cup of wine? Why not? You know, what, how is it such a big deal that, you know, Jesus multiplied the, the loaves and the fishes? He made them in the first place. Why can't he do it again? I, I don't, you know, like, it's not that we're insignificant. It's just that we're not essential. But Jesus is essential. And, you know, my dad did a lot of different things that, you know, didn't show a lot of faith. But when the consecration happened, my dad would get down on one knee, whose name was Tom, and he, you know, as Thomas said, my Lord and my God. My dad would at least humble himself there. And it's in the humility of saying, I don't know everything that allows us to learn. And that's, that's also our relationship with Jesus. You know, body, blood, soul, and divinity. If Jesus says, this is my body and this is my blood, you must eat my flesh or drink my blood or there's no life in you. So I've met, you know, and I have no problem with evangelicals. I have no problem with Baptists. I have no problem. But you know what? They're missing out on a lot. Because you can still have the word of God and you can have a sermon, right? I can go as long as any Baptist, I'll tell you. You just don't, don't, don't you know, they'll write the chancery again. You know, like, he's going too long. But, you know, that's only open, you know, there to break open what the Word says. And the essential part of this is that Jesus took bread. He broke it, said the blessing, gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, 
He took the chalice and once more giving thanks, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many so that sins may be forgiven. So we know what the reason is. The reason is for us to connect with the ministry of Jesus Christ, which is to save us from our sin, of which he's the only blood that needs to be shed anymore. You know, you don't have to take a bunch of bulls from the 12 tribes of Jerusalem, collect the blood, which is what kosher means. Did you know that? Like you're not allowed to strangle, you know, shoot in the head, all that kind of stuff. When, if you're gonna have a co kosher uh, butchering, you gotta cut the throat and let them bleed out. And then they would try and collect all the blood so that they could reenact what they did. When they got God's law, then they took half the blood, right? Poured it all over the altar covered the altar, the altar of our sin. And then he took the, the last one, and it wasn't just holy water, which is really funny, because like, I like to douse people with holy water, especially you know on Easter. Like just grab a whole thing and just woof right in your face, especially if I know you all really well, you know? <laughs> and, but I mean, could you imagine that with blood? The blood of 12 bulls, so six, you know, bull bloods, and he had, they had something, how, how, you know, how to sprinkle it. And then, you know, they, so you, you'd like be all covered in blood. So if you follow that further, this is the theology that says, you know, our sins are covered by the blood of the lamb. Okay, uh, I, I'm with that. But then he says further, especially in John, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood or there's no life in you. And he does it three times to let you know that it's essential. And this is why those who reject the principal uh, theology of the Catholic Church, of the only church that was there, is that you followed these things. I mean, you did them. I don't know how they got away from blood to holy water, but they did, right? But the notion is the same. So, you know, these rituals that we have are not without meaning, and they're not stupid. But you got to know what they mean. And that's what, why education in our faith is so vitally important. And so we understand why we're doing the things we do. So when we move into, you know, the liturgy of the Eucharist, after the, after the homily, you move into the liturgy of the Eucharist. You're done talking the words. Now you're going into the action. And in that are, are the very words that we hear in Scripture. And the intent is there. And that, you know, and that we have to enter into an act of faith every time. Because it's not fully apparent, you know, unless there's, you know, a miracle at like Lanciano where the host turns into, you know, you know, cardio um, tissue, but like blood from a, uh, from a heart. You know, unless you have those kind of miracles, which we need, uh, I'm not getting away from that, but they're just helpful for us to grasp upon something that's a truly deep mystery that requires us not to see just what's temporal, just what's in front of us, but what's spiritually happening in us. So that at that point, our heart and our soul has to leave the head versus the other way around. To bypass the skepticism and all the kind of other stuff that will never be proven. I mean, we can go back to these Eucharistic miracles and yes, you know, you can test them and those kinds of things. But the biggest thing is the growth of our faith in earth, on earth, and above the earth, that everything that's here points toward the 
mystery. Last week of the Trinity, this week of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. I, I particularly like it, not because you can do a profession, a procession around the block or whatever at the church. I mean, it, yeah, it's a good witness and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, you know, that, you know, God called me on Corpus Christi in the dawn. You know, and I had to go down to the church where, you know, the little girls are all dressed up like brides and the, you know, boys like grooms because it's a traditional time of receiving your first Holy Communion. And I'm like, I'm sitting there or kneeling there in the church and uh, I think I was still in a pretty good state of grace. But God had, you know, like, laid a big load on me and it was heavy so I had to ask myself you know like what do you really believe you know did do you really believe that God called you to be a priest and not get married and you have to go home and tell your girlfriend that you know you can't marry her well 30 some years later I guess the answer is yes and like the rest of the disciples, the apostles, you can't turn back. So the, every time that we are reminded through word and sacrament, we have to renew our own commitment to following Jesus Christ. That, that we believe, at least believe enough so that we amend our lives and try and be people who are worthy of so great a gift. Because none of us are worthy. But God will give us sufficient grace to move to the next level, whatever that level is. And, and that's what Corpus Christi is really about. It's about reminding us that Jesus said, it was him who said, eat my body and drink my blood or you have no life in you and many left him verse 6 John 6 66, 66 and many left him teaching was too hard and you can notice that whether it's a passage They want all the benefits of the covenant, but they don't want to keep it. Is that a place to quit now for the parents or the friends or whatever relationships we have with those people? No. That's when we dig in, right? And give no ground. You don't change your viewpoints because your child has decided, you know, they're going to take some stupid position. And I mean it just like that, stupid. It's unthinking. It's unrational. But you know what? If you want to be a brickhead, you can. You know, and I don't preach from a, a high point. I do not. I mean, I broke them all, man. I, I which is one reason why I, I go, you know, for what reason do you, you know, do you believe? Well, I believe because God changed my life. He took me from where I was to where I am. That's kind of funny. I didn't even think about that because that's what Jesus said, right? He said, it is you who say I am. That's how he identified himself. And I have to do that, you know? I'm going to be a priest forever. You know, I'm not going to bail on it. I don't care how hard it gets. I don't care, I don't care if you kill me. I really don't. But it wasn't always that way. Not at all. But, it, you know, if God will do that for me, he'll do it for anybody. Anybody. 
so that in the wee hours in the morning at Torpus Christi, when he came to me and he goes, I want you to be a priest. I'm going, are you serious? Like, I'm, I'm the worst sinner ever. And I talk to God just exactly like that, right? I, I just use my own words. I'm like, you've got to be kidding. We've just been through my whole confession, my whole lifetime, and you know how rotten I am. He goes, yeah. I'm like, yeah, but I love her. I'm engaged to be married. Like, I've never thought about being a priest. You know, I've only thought about being married and having children. Successful, blah, blah, blah. He goes, yes. I'm like, well, don't you pick people that are really worthy of this? Like, don't you, like, with, with priests, don't you, like, make them and then send them into the world and they grow up being little happy altar boys and really good kids and they finally go to the seminary and they're just really happy and they, like, you know, Cause I'm like a lousy guy. I'm like, and he goes, "I know what I'm doing." And he turned and walked away, and I'm like, "Talk about feeling alone in the field, you know? Like, what am I gonna do now? Cause I can't deny it. I mean, I could if I wanted to. Oh, that's just a dream. But no, I was sober and awake. No, not not all of us are gonna be given." that kind of an opportunity. But I was really, you know, entrenched in my ways and he needed to knock me off my high horse. You know, so that I, you know, said like, who are you? Rick, Rick, why do you persecute me? I didn't even know I was doing it. Didn't even know. But then, you're given a second chance. I don't know, 137 chance. And then he calls you to receive the Holy Eucharist. And and when you know you're not worthy, really, you know, I I'm really glad that my my buddy Father Mike Leitner is going to be moved from an hour. Uh, four hours away to less than an hour away. Because then we can go to confession to each other each week. And that keeps you more honest. Guys, you're not getting off the hook. And we're all going to go in there and, and, and say the same sins every week. You know, but the difference is, is that you're trying to be better. You're trying to be more holy. And in the process of that, the things of faith become more strong within you. Not just obeying the commandments, but seeing yourself as a recipient of the grace of our Lord. To free us from our sins, to bring us joy, and to fill us with good food. So that morning, you know, was the Feast of Corpus Christi. And uh, it was powerful. It was powerful. Because I was in a good state of grace. And there's more to it. But I mean, like, the thing is that, that you realize that God loves you so much that he would literally die for you personally so that he might erase your sins and then give you his very body and blood, soul and divinity so that you might have true holiness within you to change you. Same vessel, right? You're not going to look any different. It's the same vessel. But the inside has been cleaned out and, and good wine has been put in instead. And that makes all the difference. So then, we are to be poured out as a libation, as a drink, for all our neighbors. And that's what the life of faith is. Once you get it, and you own it, then you give it away. 
and it works. It really works. You know, I went to a dog trail yesterday. Within within hours, everybody knows who I am. The rumor spreads, right? And and no one's wearing a mask. And everybody's like glad to be out there and it's a beautiful day and all that. But just my presence there changes things. Just like your presence in the in the places and purposes and work and play and everything that you do, they know who you are. Maybe you're the only person in your whole family that believes in Jesus Christ. When you show up to a family you know, gathering, they know. They might not say anything, but they know. So our witness is our presence, first and foremost. You don't have to be a great pre preacher. You don't have to make great arguments. You don't have to, like, win over them, you know, in a whole bunch of other ways. It's just your very presence. And that's what Jesus told us. I will be with you always until the end of the age. And how is that? In the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the Holy Mass. So we, we become what we eat. If we take Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity into us, it changes us, even if we don't notice what it is. But you know, to do it as worthily as we can, which starts moving us into the other sacraments, right? To confession, to the sacraments of the sick, to having a worthy marriage, you know? So my brothers and sisters, this is a great day. It's a great day in faith because it's the Feast of Corpus Christi, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But also because like, look, man, Remember when it was cold and snowy? It's not cold and snowy. It's warm and green. And the birds love it. And the grapevines are growing like little weeds, right? It, this is the way of life, you know? And, and we start up, you know, like we're young. And then we go and pretty soon we find our old, what, I'm 60? What the Sam? You know what? At every stage of our life, in every place we are, we're all the same when we come to the table of the Lord. So let us try and each time, you know, confess our sins so that we might worthily receive our Lord and Savior. And then I bought this little monstrance in Metzgore. And, uh, and uh, Joe mounted the tabernacle on the wall and that's in there and uh, that means I can open it you know anytime day or night and uh, worship the Lord but it's just a piece of bread not in my book at least I'm going to treat it like it's more than that so on this beautiful day that God has made let us rejoice in the fact that we have God with us till the end of the age, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.